Meeting of the Finance Committee to order at 7 p.m. This is a hybrid meeting. So um, I'll identify all of the members present here, as well as the member present um, by Zoom. And all of our votes will need to be by roll call. Um, present is Jim Healy, Connor, Carol Fischetti, Josh Levy, John Connolly. I'm Kelton and on Zoom, Barry Kaufman, and I am present um, as well in the meeting, Louise Small. All right, our first item is citizen request to address the finance committee. I don't know if we have any. Do we have any on? Okay. Um, Safe Acquire Needham had asked to join us, and yesterday, I guess there was a new study. That was released in yesterday they asked to postpone that meeting to sometime in February. So we'll meet with them then. Um, approval of minutes of prior meetings. I don't have any minutes right now. I have some come back to um Catherine Copley. They let me Google okay. land somewhere. So hopefully you're able to find them and um, then we'll be able to distribute them. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've done I haven't worked with Google Doc a while, and that's where they Ended up going in my computer. Oh, okay. so we'll have to make sure we can retrieve them. Okay, you can. Okay, <laughs> I can help you with that. <laughs> I was gonna actually bring my computer. <laughs> you could, you could just. <laughs> okay, good. They exist. I'm able to find them, but they're lost somewhere where I don't know them. Um. Okay. So fiscal year 25, um, department has budget hearings. The first budget is the town floor. So uh, that is Barry Kaufman and I are the liaisons for the town clerk. And I'll just give a brief introduction, unless Barry, you want to chime in at all. Uh, but Barry and I met with Teddy Eaton on January 6th uh, to review the budget. <laughs> and the um, couple of just big observations is that, and pardon me if I get the language wrong, but the uh, June 2022 Voting Act, yes, yes, um, really changed the the way that Hetty and her team do their work and um, for elections and increase the uh, amount of time and effort and some of the communications it takes to run an election. And uh, kind of an astounding fact that was in the write-up was uh, he claims that since the June 2022 Voting Act, a third of town clerks in Massachusetts have either retired or resigned. So, um, so it's, it's 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 difficult. So for this fiscal year, fiscal year 2024, uh, there are two elections, correct? The one we're in. The year we're in. We're, I'm so agree. So the year we're in, I believe there are two elections. There's the presidential primary in March. And the April town. And the April town election. Yes, correct. Um, so the increase this year uh, was fairly modest. In fiscal year 2025, for this budget review, uh, the increases are more substantial, largely because there are three elections on the calendar. There's the town election 25, and the then the state and the primaries, right? So, um, so with that, you know, taken into consideration, fiscal year 2025. Uh, the salary and wages go up modestly uh, by $2,614. However, the increase for temporary workers and election workers to staff that third election is far more substantial. And the increase there is $47,109 for uh, uh, largely for moving to two from two elections to three. Um, some of the other increases, substantial increases, as the expense 
this budget increased by $21,750. Again, mostly concentrated in communications and increase in the number of ballots and voting by mail required by three elections versus two. Um, the other thing to note in the budget is that there is a temporary, a part-time staff position uh, in the budget that is unfilled. And we believe it's going to be filled by yes. the end of this year? I hope so. How long has that been open? Oh, maybe six months. Okay. And um, just for the record, we received over 2,000 vote by mail postcards today for the elections that are coming up. So we are going to be out straight for the next six months. Okay. And then with that, I'll turn it over to Kenny, unless Barry has any comments. Uh, no additional comments. Thanks, Carol. One, one of the problems we are facing right now is we lost two very important part-time people due to illness, and we're not going to get them back for these upcoming elections. So I'm looking into bringing in a couple of people that I know that are organizing. Every vote by mail postcard requires to be entered into the RIS system. It has to go back into the system when you send the ballot out. It has to go back into the system when you bring the ballot back. I mean, there's just so much manual labor involved in this. And in 2022, we had over 9,600. And I guess we're going to have that much again. Only we've got, got an additional election with the president. Right. And what did you say that despite the mail-in ballots, um, 840 voters walked in the door? Oh, I was so mad. Yes, they applied for them. We had early voting in the town hall, which we will have beginning February 24th for a week. And um, so we had 9,600 vote by mail. We had about 1,500 in-person voters. And then on election day, 840 dropped it in the red box. And why don't you go to the polls? Yeah. Or why don't we just do election online? Because I think that's where we're going. I could be wrong. I don't know what else to say. It's a busy, busy year for this mm -hmm. office. And any other questions, questions? or? So just the, the voting act or the, the new law, Teddy, doesn't apply to our town elections. It's just to the well, state and federal elections. We accept you can uh, ask the select board to vote to approve early voting for the annual town election. And the first time I did this was last year and we had a reduced number of hours, like, you know, maybe five days, 10 to two. And we did get people, but I figured the voters are going to say, well, you did it for the town state election. Why aren't you doing it for the town election? So that's why I, I requested that they do it. I'm not sure about this time because we are so busy because it's within a six week period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just tossing that. So the answer out. is technically it doesn't apply, but if you, you provided that service. The law requires time. that you get approval from the select board to um, have early voting for a local election. Yes, but it's not mandatory. But it's not mandatory. <clears throat> Thank you. You're welcome. Barry, did you have your hand up? Just curious in terms of the, um, for example, this primary is unlikely to have any, unlikely to be contested, you know, by the time the primary is, is, is here. Is that going to... You, you, it doesn't change the hours you have to be open. It may change the volume, I guess, but it really doesn't affect from an expense standpoint. You'll still have to incur the same amount of expense. Well, if we keep getting these vote by mail postcards, it, it could even increase the expenses. I'm, we we just got the big batch in this afternoon, and we have to go through them to see. Most people are checking all elections. And of course, the state didn't put on the system our local election. So we, Kevin's had to go in and add a few that wanted all elections plus the town election. We've tried to correct that so that going forward, we don't have to do it multiple times. But I, I think it's, 
But believe me, the state elections are trying to catch up too. I right? uh, they're working very hard. Plus, they're trying to do a lot of training for the for the new clerks. Like we have a Zoom once or twice a week on um, what comes next. <laughs> Jim. Yes, I had a couple of comments. So, um, did the board of select board? Did they take any action? Uh, last night, with respect to your position, yes, I know they that, did. and they did what? They voted to put the position of town clerk on the ballot this April for the unexpired term, April ending April 2025. Okay. And I have offered to stay on on a part time basis to help anyone that goes in as town clerk. So first off, congratulations. I'm not sure. I'm so used to this. You did a great job and for, for a long time, and we relied on, and the town relied on you to run a very fair, safe election system, and, and you did a great job. And I was there to witness a number of occasions when some things were done that may not have been 100% appropriate, and you always handled it really very professionally, uh, very delicately, but always abiding by uh, what the rules of polling stations are. So... Uh, congratulations for your service. I am concerned about one thing, and that is, um, you know, historically, we have a warrant that has, you know, the town clerk salaries established. And, you know, I, I don't have all the facts and figures, but it seems to me the salary is out of whack for a under six years' experience, Correct. absolutely out of whack. Yeah. And, you know, assuming we don't get somebody that comes from another town who has greater than six years of service, which is not going to happen because you just said how many of them have already left the service to retire. The likelihood is we're going to have someone that's less than six years of service. So uh, I guess my first uh, is a request, which is I think we need to do a um, survey of other town clerks within the towns with which we compare ourselves. And at least we can get a sense, forget about whether it's greater than six years, less than six years, just find out what are the town clerks being paid on average uh, compared to the towns with which we compare ourselves. So that's one request. I don't know who I make that request to, except to the chair and to Dave. Um, uh, but, so I don't really know because I know I don't know who has support to be able to do that. But it seems to me I may be able to get that information for you because there could be an association. Okay. Association mm -hmm. okay. tries to keep an updated list. Perfect. So but that's so can that, I say something? Oh yeah. I I personally feel that if you had an appointed person to come in, you would pay what the salary current salary is. So the elected person I think should get just the same. Right. So, so then, but so then the question is, because whoever comes in is going to jump in running. Right. And, and they're going to be, if they come in at that lower salary, they're going to be paid less than the people that are working in the office, which, Some of them, yes. which doesn't, and, and I, I'm not suggesting that I know anyone's salary, but the point is that doesn't make any sense. But even though I, I understand what you said about being appointed versus elected, the point is town meeting is still going to be asked to vote on that warrant article. Correct. And so, I think we need to send a message to the select board that we need to consider amending that article if they're just going to put in the same thing that they've done for the last 15 years. I, I honestly think that um, our town manager would go along with that. Okay. So I guess, Louise, again, I don't know if, if that's you or Dave, but someone could relay to the select board mm -hmm. and the town manager that we believe just needs to be taken up and be on the warrant. No amendment at town meeting, you know, it's got to be in the official warrant that, you know, is printed and goes out to town meeting members. Don't be taken back. Okay, thank you. Other than that, I just want to say I really enjoyed your professionalism and working with you. Thank you. Uh, I have a specific question about the um, salary increases, which seem very low to me at $2,600 for. The uh, well, Dave tells me what I can put in. Dave, then <laughs> it just seems very low relative to the total salary fund. 
there were a couple of things that are happening. One, there's been some turnover okay. in, in staff. The second is uh, two of the positions are unionized and they don't have a contract for. Oh, okay. Thank you, James. You know, when we're working on some of the other budgets, it just seemed very low. Right here. Okay. All right. Any other questions? So I, I guess I missed everything. So are you, <laughs> are, are you retiring, Teddy? Or what? I don't, I don't. Uh, yes. I'm going to retire seven days after the April 24 town election. And I'm willing to stay on and help train a, a new clerk through the fall elections. Okay. All right. Well, I, I missed that part. So thank you for uh, and clarifying that. And I'll echo what Jim's comments were. And congratulations. And you've done a wonderful job. And um, you've been a great Pass it to our oh, it's going to make you upset. Okay. Thank you, Teddy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, I'm still here. <laughs> All right. And Chair, uh, the planning board, community development, with all the individuals who will be coming in remote. Okay. Stop bringing them in. Okay. I think we just need to say who they are. As yeah. we move. Bringing in. Adam Block, member of the planning board. Jeff Anderson, also the director of conservation. Bringing in Lee Newman, director of planning community development. Natasha Espada, <laughs> member of the planning board. Yes, Natasha Espada, member of the planning board. In particular, she's the vice chair. Okay, thank you. And Liz Lee, member of the planning board, correct? Spoken. Yeah. Spoken to Nope, and we won't bring in Liz unless she wants to join them. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your entire group? Yes, it is. Thank you, Lee. All right, I will turn it over to the liaisons. Okay, so um, Josh and I were the liaisons for um, planning and uh, community development. It's tab 20 in our uh, budget book. Um, we met with um, Lee, uh, I think it was at the end of November, or the beginning of December. Uh, December. Yes, that's about yeah. right. Yeah, right, the, um, and, and, and walked through the budget. Um, and I'll just provide some um, opening remarks and outlining versus certain things. And then um, Lee and others on the call, um, Adam and Natasha, uh, Debbie, others want to add some things, please do. Um, so within planning and community development, there are three divisions, um, the planning division, the conservation commit division, and the board of appeals. Um, there are currently 5.53. I want to find out who the point three is, um, FPEs. Um, and they're divided up between uh, four full-time positions, which is the Director of Planning and Community Development, the Assistant Town Planner, the Conservation Manager, and then the Conservation Specialist. So those are four full-time positions. And then the remaining um, 1.53 FTE is divided between uh, part-time um, administrative um, positions and roles that are played. Um, the amount for those salaries, the 5.53 and, um, temporary, um, services and overtime in FY24, our current fiscal year, um, is $575,608. Um, and it's sort of, and it's projected to go up. I'm sorry. That's what the, the projected amount for FY25 is. It's an increase, um, of about 1.8%. Um, expenses uh, between FY24 and FY25 are projected, or the request is an additional $2,400, going from $38,450 in FY24, our current fiscal year, to $40,850 for FY25 budget request. Um, the total DSR2 FY25 request um, for a base amount, combining the salaries um, with the expenses is $627,296. Um, 
There are two DSR uh, four requests that um, are set forth in the budget book. The first one is a DSR four request to hire a full time planner. Um, the amount requested there is broken into three components with an $80,000 salary, $2,000 uh, for expenses, um, computer and phone and otherwise, and then 37,776, which would be outside of the DSR request, but within the town's amount for benefits. So the total amount of that DSR for uh, request for hiring a new position, a new full-time planner, um, with all the components, it's just a little bit under 120000 at 119776 Um The second DSR-4 is for a part-time, non-benefited position of 10 hours per week uh, to provide additional administrative and office support. Um, that's broken down into uh, $13,700 for wages and $2,000 in expenses. Um, for a total amount of $15,700. Uh, currently, um, within the department, they have um, a part-time administrative um, person who does 27.5 hours a week. And this DSR 4 request would bring the total administrative support um, up to a, a full-time 37.5 hours. And that's the basis in the re of this um, second DR um, DSR-4 request for the part-time administrative help. In addition to the two DSR-4 requests, there are two DSR-5 financial warrant articles. Um, the first one is a request uh, for an appropriation of $80,000 for planning consulting assistance. As people may remember, periodically, there's a financial warrant article um, that's presented to town meeting to provide these services. It was one in FY 2015 for an amount of $45,000. And then there was an amount in FY 2022 for $60,000. Now those amounts can be sp spread out and paid over just different fiscal years by virtue of them being financial warrant articles. Um, the FY 2015 $45,000 amount has been fully expended. And the FY 2022 FY 2022 amount of 60,000 is well on its way to uh, being expended. Um, primarily, it's being used at the current time um, for consulting services that are being provided to the uh, the planning department um, on the NBTA um, Zoning um, uh, Communities Act um, that's currently under discussion um, amongst the town. Um, so that DSR five would be for eighty thousand dollars to. Um, provide them have that program and have funds available for the upcoming fiscal years um, to hire consultants for various um, projects or studies that are that are being undertaken. The other DSR5 warrant article is an, another continuation of an existing program, and that is the small repair grant program. Um, the amount requested is $50,000, which um, is in line with what has been um, requested in previous years. Um, I look back and this $50,000 amount um, was part of um, town meeting appropriations for FY 2020, FY 2022, FY 2023, and then our current fiscal year, FY 2024. And so um, this amount, the grant amount would be in line with those prior appropriations and available for the persons um, who uh, fall under that program, under the eligibility requirements and present the requisite projects that are satisfied um, with the standards and procedures for that program and go through the process for um, applying and then getting approved and then having the work done. So that is an outline of the budget request and um, I'll turn it over to uh, the folks um, and the department if they want to um, add anything or correct anything. Um, I don't, Adam, if you want to go first or I'll, I'll go first. I just want to speak to, um, I think that's a very good summary of our, of our budget request. 
Um, I think I want to speak a little bit about our request for the planning assistance that we've requested um, in light of what we anticipate our demands to be over the course of the next um, five years. Um, there are some major, there's really some major planning work that we are anticipating needed to needing to accomplish. A big chunk of that will probably come out of work that will be required after the um, housing is actually um, adopted under the NBTA Communities Act. And that is, I think, looking at some of the things that weren't done as a result of that housing initiative that need to be done as complementary work within our existing zoning districts, but in particular, the Center Business District, Chestnut Street Business District. And I think a relook at the business district along Highland Avenue where Sudbury Farms is located, um, and the Hillside Business District. Certainly this planning work that's being done currently is, is very significant, but in order to really take advantage of all of the, um, the redevelopment, I think that we'd like to see and, and in a forum where it's going to actually benefit Needham and we're providing really the economic foundation to enable it. I think some of the underlying rules within those zoning districts will need to be examined to complement that work. And so that's really what I see happening over the course of the next, you know, two to three years in terms of complementary work where we need additional planning assistance and consultant assistance to advance that agenda. Additionally, I think that I think probably um, the other initiative I think that's going to need to be taken, take, take, looked at are our parking regulations. And we had utilized Santec that did a major uh, study for the downtown. And out of that came some recommendations about changes that were appropriate, probably in the center, Avery Square, and perhaps townwide. Um, that need to be reflected in terms of regulatory modifications in terms of what the parking standards are and how that's managed. And so that work um, is going to need to be followed up with planning with probably some some additional consulting work and uh, hopefully a full time planner to assist it. And then I think the third major piece is inclusionary zoning. So I think out of this MBTA Communities Act is probably going to come some standards of what the percentage of affordable housing units should be. Um, in uh, multiple, multiple family developments. And if that's only targeted to the areas that are being rezoned under the MBTA Communities Act, I think it needs to be revisited in terms of how it, how it should be applied townwide. So there's kind of a universal application that's consistent. So I think those, and maybe Adam can speak about some other things he might see on the table um, in terms of what we're looking at trying to accomplish over the course of the next few years and why we've actually, you know, requested the $80,000 um, in additional planning assistance to help in those initiatives. And I think also um, a full-time planner that would help us advance that um, to meet the expectations that the town is really now um, articulated for the planning department and its expectations on the kind of work it wants to see done and the pace under which it wants to see it accomplished. I, um, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Uh, I think Lee provided uh, um, an excellent uh, narrative of ultimately what we're saying is uh, the department foresees significant demand on our facilities, on our capability. That uh, may result in an increased number of applications and an increased review. But I also foresee a period of time where we're we are, as a planning department, both staff and in particular elected officials, are more <laughs> proactively, are, are planning in a more proactive way. One of the things that we've already begun to undertake, for instance, is to build a planning schedule, like an Excel spreadsheet, the way that, um, you know, the way that developers, you know, plan through the phases of demolition to uh, to completion and delivery of a space we're doing building the same mindset and capability in our planning department because we have multiple tracks that we're planning. There is a lot of residential planning that uh, will occur in part as a result of the implementation of the MBTA communities law, but there will also be a significant amount of work that we foresee, depending on what happens at town meeting, uh, to augment that work so that we're developing and uh, so that we're developing, um, you know, in line with where we foresee the best opportunities for the town. That also uh, uh, that also means taking a look at our commercial areas, which are obviously taxed at uh, at a different rate than the residential sector, 
and also provide an opportunity um, for an uplift, uh, you know, in our overall um, uh, tax revenue um, as the town's expenses continue, you know, to continue to rise. And there is there are opportunities to do that. Yet, what's most important is whatever opportunities we pursue that we ought to manage this development in a responsible and a balanced way. And that takes a lot of planning consideration. It takes a lot of community engagement. And it also takes a lot of uh, staff and resources within the department to be able to properly track, measure, and, um, you know, and, and implement. And um, uh, I anticipate, for instance, on housing, that we'll be dealing with another large house review in the coming year. Um, and that, I think, is not going to be a small effort. I also, uh, uh, as Lee had mentioned, we'll talk, we're talking about uh, improving and modernizing our uh, parking standards and our parking bylaw. And I also think that we'll be participating with, uh, with other departments in town, like, for instance, the Department of Public Works, to uh, uh, more coherently, um, forgive me, that's one of my medical devices, uh, making an alarm that I need to attend to later, but I apologize for the interruption. Um, the, uh, for instance, you know, in, in dealing with the Department of Public Works to ensure that our infrastructure is, uh, you know, is, um, uh, provides the, the capability and the capacity uh, to grow as the rest of the town is growing, both in the residential and a commercial or industrial sector. And in addition to, uh, to those um, to those elements, there may be an opportunity to review, for instance, the zoning in the mixed use 128 area that could become a more productive commercial district for the town. And um, and so we foresee a substantial demand on all of our capacity over the course of the next five years. Thank you, um, Josh. I um, so have a question about the, I guess it's related to the consulting assistance. On, on the home committee, we're always talking about how we ensure that de intended developments actually occur. W will these consultants be able to help with that, not just with housing, but also any, any intended commercial developments? Because putting in the zoning is one thing, but I think the ultimate goal is actually realizing uh, a development project at, the, at those sites. Well, I think that I think that's the goal. I think that's I think the goal is making sure that the regulatory framework is done in such a way as it's going to incent the kind of development that we want to see, and that the bar and that the barriers are eliminated. And if there are any barriers that exist currently, that we're we're aware of them and we're modifying the regulatory framework so that um, the outcomes that we desire are 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 going forward. And that we're successfully working with people who own land that's ripe for development, who are interested in doing development, and helping them open up those parcels where it's beneficial to the town. Thank you. Uh, Lee and um, anybody else can comment. You know, with the MBTA Communities Act and our, the town's requirement to have zoning in place by December of this year, you know, then fast forward, are there grants available to support any of the planning assistance that you may be requiring over the next few years? Because wasn't that part of the MBTA Communities Act that if, you know, once we have a plan in place, we would be able to apply for grants to kind of support this development going forward. So I'm just wondering if you could comment on that. Um, I, I I haven't researched the the specific grants that are available, but I have the same understanding that you do that there will be some planning funds coming out of the state to complement this work. I can't speak you know specifically to a particular grant that we'll be applying for. We did receive a grant that's actually paying you know sixty thousand uh, dollars toward the work that we are doing toward the MBTA Community Act, and that's complementing the the consulting funds that you guys previously ap appropriated. I think back in twenty twenty one, which is enabling that work. And I would just add to that, if I may, Madam Chair, that um, uh, that we need you know we need to over the course of of the short time ahead 
um, dig in and, and uh, quantify what the needs will be uh, on a monetary basis and also understand what the sources of revenue will be, including investigating any potential uh, grants. The members of the committee. Um, I have a question about the additional, the DSR 404 town planner. So are there certain activities that you're not able to perform today due to not having sufficient staff? There's planning activities that we're not able to, to perform. I mean, because we're, we're, we're limited. I mean, the staff that we have now, the first obligation, of course, is to meet our regulatory um, requirements. So applications that are being filed have to be processed first. Um, and so the surplus time that people have gets dedicated to planning. And so what ends up happening is you're prioritizing your planning projects based upon your staffing capacity. Uh, which means that if there are a number of initiatives that the town is interested in in proceeding with, they're they're prioritized and they can't all be addressed at the same time. So there's a lot of interest right now in relooking at um, the large house initiative. Was it successful? Should there be further adjustments to it? Um, that's on the back burner because we don't have the staff to do it, and we're working on, on we're working on the NBTA Communities Act. There's interest in re-examining the parking standards um, because there's a sense that they are too um, restrictive, especially as they relate to housing, um, and need to be adjusted in places where in the center, for example, or along Chestnut Street, and that those requirements themselves may be getting in the way of development happening because they're requiring parking in circumstances where it's not necessary and it's adding cost. So there are those kinds of things that we'd like to do. Um, and they don't, they just kind of, you have to prioritize your time. What is what is the most important thing to do? What is, you know, is essential. And so the housing, um, the Needham Housing Authority um, redevelopment proposal and basically the MBTA work have just kind of gone to the top of the list. And these other initiatives, which people feel are important, um, get pushed farther down. And I think that's really the question is how important are they to the community to get to advance them? And how quickly do you want to see them advanced? Um, so I just have a follow up question to that. So basically what you're looking to do is to free up more of your time, the assistant town planners time to work on these more policy, these broader questions. And to and the and the additional person that we're bringing on on board. Yes. So you would have that person work on these broader issues as well. Yes, I think the 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 interest is is to be able to work on these more policy and planning related issues, um, and to move them forward at a faster pace. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Yes. No. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Should I have a public work? Uh, yeah, so we're starting with the vehicles, but we can certainly bring them in. Um, Barry, Ed. And Tom. Very Paul and I are going to get on various um, BW budgets. And I'm just going to start with um, a little bit of an overview, you know, broad 
brush of DPW. So the DPW budget is increasing a little bit more than some of the other, or the requests are a little higher than some of the other departments. Um, interestingly, the DPW was more seriously affected by COVID than a lot of the other departments and is continuing to see after effects of COVID, both um, in terms of staffing, where they lost a lot of staff and had a lot of vacancies for a couple of years, and now are seeing those vacancies being filled and are working on restaffing um, the, what do you have, nine different divisions within DPW at this point? The nine different divisions at DPW. The other thing um, that they're seeing is a, a larger part of their budget are contractual services than some of the other town budgets. And they're seeing the effects of inflation on those um, contractual services. And they're also seeing the continued um, lag and the continued, um, continued issues with respect to supply chain in a lot of um, the divisions. So the budget reflects um, what I think is like the aftermath of COVID that is not as evident in um, some of the other budgets. Um, so if I'm going to take them slightly out of order from what we have in um, the agenda, I'd like to do fleet first, which I think we can go through fairly quickly. And then if we could do the enterprise funds next and then get to like the really needy um, DPW. Um, if that's all right with everyone. Um, so the fleet, did you have another handout? Please? Yes, it's um, at everybody's uh, seat. Okay. So um, we received a new handout with respect to the fleet um, request for fiscal year um, 25. And I met with um, Dave and Cecilia to review the financial aspects of that fleet request. And what we're um, what we talked about was smoothing out the request for townwide fleet to about two and a half million dollars a year. So if we look at what the requests were um, on an annual basis, they fluctuate depending upon the different vehicles. And so we talked about two and a half million dollars, ideally all in cash. And the other thing that we talked about was using the capital improvement fund as a smoothing mechanism, very similar to the smoothing mechanism for the debt in, the interest, debt service. Um, so using it as um, a mechanism to supplement in years where we might need it. And then if we have excess funds in a particular year, then put those into the stabilization fund so that we can deal with the ups and downs. Um, so for fiscal year 25, um, we're looking at a little under like 2.35 million, which is a little less than 2.5 million. So if um, it works out and we have sufficient cash, I think the plan would be to add a little bit more to the capital improvement fund. Um, and it all depends where everything else falls into place at the time the warrant is put together. Um, and the... There are various requests every year. Dave sits down with all the different departments to determine whether vehicles are needed or are not needed. There are some vehicles that while they were on the replacement plan last year for this fiscal year have been moved out because they have more light and also some are simply being eliminated. On the other hand, certain vehicles had to be um, accelerated because they're at the point where they're no longer usable, or some of them are being changed. Um, for instance, the police department vehicle um, is being changed from Ford F-150 to an F-250 based upon the needs of that particular department. Um, and then the other uh, big thing is that assuming free cash is we haven't had it certified yet. No, we have not. Yeah. So assuming it comes in where we're hoping it comes in, um, we would um, fund even the fire engine at $1.2 million um, in cash. So right now there's a question of whether we're going to borrow or um, use cash for that. Um, we did talk also about the green communities and um, 
when there would be a change in policy with respect to electric vehicles and more um, fuel efficient vehicles and what the costs associated with that would be. Um, and right now we don't have the policy, so we can't really say what the changes are going to be, but we know for certain that there's going to be a requirement for more electric vehicles. So we're gonna need more electric vehicle charging stations. Um, and so that's going to be coming down the line. Um, that did result in at least the um, request for a new, is it the new bus for the school department? Or it's the bluebird that's yeah. been deferred. To being deferred so that we can look into options for electric vehicles um, and also the infrastructure that would be required for an electric bus. Um, so, you know, that's the very high um, view of what is in um, the fleet department budget. Um, I was satisfied after sitting down with the department and with Dave that um, all of everything was thought through very thoroughly and um, Dave does this all himself. <laughs> And so thinking through which vehicles should be moved where. And um, I think that this is a good um, budget for the fleet um, replacement cycle for fiscal year um, 25. And I'll open that up for questions. Um, two questions. One is, are these gross numbers? Are they uh, Or do they reflect any salvage value or resale value for ones that we're replacing? No, they reflect the... Uh, gross price for um for the vehicle because and how do we handle well to give, just walking through the process sure. of, of ones that that you know we can resell or or trade or yeah. something like that vehicles that we dispose of there um there are two primary ways one would be to offer it up as a trade in terms of the uh um procurement of the vehicle <laughs> or what we've been doing more often now because it's uh, gives us a better return is actually offering them for auction. Uh, vehicles are purchased, monies come in, and they go to the general treasury. And sometimes it's over there, they're at the rotate. So sometimes the cars or the trucks will go down to replace an older car or truck. Right. And so what they'll be auctioning off is the worst. Is the worst. Yeah. So I guess what I my point is the value isn't always. No, I know I understand that part. I'm not questioning it. It didn't yeah. was unclear in the process of, of uh, yes, but we do budget based upon what we expect the gross price will be for the vehicle. And and as I said the last several years, we haven't been offering trades only in a very rare circumstance where uh um, complete uh, supervisor that can be a little creative putting the package together from the different skeletons and encourages uh uh, a good um, good offer, a generally offered in auction. So then my next question, um, if I could just finish yeah, my question, ahead, yeah, on, on the fire engine, um, is, is this a um, replacing something we currently have or is it adding a, a, a new vehicle to our fleet? Is this the, the, the Inspector's car or the actual engine? The 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 one point two million. I mean, of, of the two point five, almost half of it's taken up by one right one so, unit. So, so it's, my be, question is about that that unit. It's it's going to replace the two thousand five E one engine, which is known as the Cyclone two, and we'll be hoping to purchase a twenty twenty five E one vehicle that is known as a Typhoon. <laughs> Is that an upgrade? Yeah, an upgrade. <laughs> okay, so in, in other words, it'll be taking the space of an existing. Or we won't have a net. We won't have an increase in the fleet. Okay. And right. it takes what two years now to get a. About a two year lead. It's a two year lead for the, the latter trucks uh, engines. You might be able to pull off in eighteen months. Okay. But of course, that order would not happen until the earliest would be July. Yeah. And there's plenty of time when fire. Engines are out of, so they have to be a certain number of years before they're out of compliance with safety codes. Yes, and that's one of the factors that come into play. But uh, the way the trucks are used, the rusting also becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. Understandably. Um, and then my last question was the the the, the term new school. Um, and then a utility van would lift. 
is it that is, is an is expansion it, in the fleet um, for the uh, school department for their uh, production services? Okay, so it's not a, a student, it's not a lift for handicap purposes, it's a lift for cargo lift. The cargo lift. Those are my questions. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you. So the proceeds of auctions, do those go back to the general fund? Yes, they do. Would would those be on candidates for uh, those proceeds to go into the capital improvement fund? Often I recommend that to the to the uh, select board, to the finance committee, and then that's been the funding source, I can recall, in the last couple of years. Okay. Anything else that you want to add, Harris? <clears throat> no, I think um, we do a fairly thoughtful process of evaluating the equipment and making sure we have a few um, pieces that were um, have been problematic because of some emissions issues with the diesel engines. And so we're converting those over to gas. Um, I think these are the last two that we have in the fleet that are from that line. Um, we had quite a few of them that um, did not last as long as we had would have preferred. And I think the other thing, um, as we go into the capital process, we have a recommendation for two phases of a construction for public works, one of which includes a fleet wash bay which is one of the areas we're currently not in compliance with our NIFTES permit, but also would have a value in extending the life of our equipment. A lot of the times, because these are frontline pieces that are exposed to significant salt um, during events, because we can't appropriately wash them down after each event, they do corrode faster than if we were able to have a, an, you know, an appropriate facility. So um, that there is a, uh, hopefully, um, a process coming into play in the near future that will help us extend the life cycle of our frontline snow and ice equipment. And the vast majority of the pieces of equipment in public works are frontline snow and ice pieces. Thank you. Um, all right, so if we could go to sewer next. I'm sure I think that would work. Right, so the sewer enterprise fund budget, um, the reason I think it's going to be fairly quick is there are no DSR4 requests in fiscal year 25. Um, and the total increase in the budget right now is 1.9%. Um, there will be a higher increase once um, the MWRA assessment is ascertaining. I think it will be probably be closer to 2.5% um, overall, possibly even 3%. Overall, um, salary and wages are increasing by 4.4%, and this is where having um, younger employees is making a difference. Not that it's not good to have younger employees, but now um, every year they get a step increase, they get COLA, they might get more licenses, resulting in higher salary line increase. So it actually adds, because of the class and compensation, it moved every single employee within the union into a step and into mm -hmm. a lower step. So I believe the if, if there's only one or two employees who are at max right now. So it's almost everyone within DPW who's eligible. Yeah, and, and it's a noticeable increase. Um, and then with respect to um, the expenses for the sewer enterprise fund, they are um, driven by contractual increases in um, the work that the sewer um, enterprise fund does. Um, and there's really not a lot here that the um, can be controlled other than some of the assumptions um, with respect to inflation. So there may be some savings um, going forward if for instance soil pipe inflation is not as high as anticipated. But you won't know that until you have new contracts Correct. for fiscal year 25. Um, but overall there's there was really nothing else that was being requested in sewer than those salary increases and the contractual increases. Mm -hmm. Anybody has questions, specific questions? Yeah, Josh. I do. So I have questions about the drains program. Mm -hmm. um, can you remind me what the total drains amount is in the budget? Um, I don't think so. Because the reason I ask is because I feel like this is one of the most confusing in budget items. No, that's fair because of the transfer. Yeah. Um, 
Too bad. I think it might have been in the water. That drains of being there. The uh, the drains of um mount for FY25 is seven hundred seventy-six thousand zero one nine. So seven hundred seventy-six zero one nine. Thank you. Yeah. Um is there so some of that is nifties the water quality some of it is playing catch basins and more making sure that the water can go into the, the drains how can we make your job easier <laughs> for clearing drains and, and getting the water quality like is is it like we, we have a capacity issue with flooding can can funding solve that in the short term or is this a much longer term problem? So I guess I'll give you the spiel I've been giving all the neighbors where I've been going and doing this flooding meeting with uh, 21 neighborhoods where they had issues. So um, it really is a large, so it's hard to say there's a capacity problem. The town did drain when we've had high rain events, it's draining relatively quickly. It's just not draining fast enough to not impact people's properties. So it's, you know, water's not sitting in the road for, a day roads aren't washing away, but what we're we're running into is the water um, and the pipe is coming up into the roadway, which is fine. And then, you know, the last five minutes of the storm, ten minutes of the storm, it's spilling over the, the sidewalk into driveways and then um, potentially into into people's properties. So um, the issue is the capacity of the pipe, not the inlets or any of the structures that are there uh, for the vast majority of areas. And the majority of areas that are flooding are low lying areas with poor dirt poor draining soils um, that have historically flooded, but obviously we're getting more frequency of intense rain events, so they're flooding more frequently. Um, the issue is, is that the majority of them are in, in, they're in the middle of the town. They're not near the Charles River, which is ultimately where our water is going to go. So in order to fix the issue, once we finish the stormwater master plan that just got funded by ARPA funding, um, or it was the first part of it got funded by ARPA funding, um, uh, two weeks ago, when we get those recommendations, they're going to start at the Charles River and work their way in. Because if you make improvements where the issues are and work your way out, you're just creating new bottlenecks. So the problem is it's going to take a very long time to get to those areas. So what we're hoping as part of the stormwater master plan is to get some recommendations in areas where we can store water temporarily. So that way, that hour that it takes for the town to drain, you have a place for water to go. That's the treatment that they use in areas where they're more prone to having storms like this, like in the um, Southwest. The problem is we don't have a lot of space, unlike the Southwest. So um, I don't know if in the operating budget per se, there's anything we can do to resolve the issues. I will say we may be having a conversation later because the DPW has spent more money than we would have anticipated and being um, responsive and proactive to flooding issues. So we have had overnight um, high intensity rain predicted where we've had to provide staff overnight. We're not a 24 hour operation. Um, we've had to do, because we've had an increase in um, insurance requests um, and other concerns, we've done a lot of cameraing of our system, which has to be, a lot of it has to be done at night, also in current or overtime. Um, we haven't really found many issues systemically. It's just like everything in New England, things were sort of put together as they evolved and wasn't a lot of thought process and how it all inter interrelates with each other. And so now we're sort of untangling that. And so it's going to take time and capital investment in order to untangle that. And this could be another place where funding, uh, capital improvement funds could be helpful mm -hmm. um, to plan for, I mean, if we have to increase capacity, building new pipes is going to be expensive. Yeah, so we um, have a project. We are uh, just bid out the second phase of it, Concord at Burnside, which is an area that um, is in my tenure flooded fairly significantly in 2013 and resulted in our pre our current drainage um, capacity mass uh, capacity capital improvements. Um, and we were looking at about $1,000 per um, foot for pipe. Um, there's expensive. Um, it's labor intensive and the pipes at some point you run out of space to put a pipe of a certain capacity. So um, I sort of had indicated uh, that even if the money was not an issue and I could get all the resources to do all the capital improvements, I can't shut the town down so we can tear up every road simultaneously in order to install the pipe. So 
even if we didn't have financial concerns, you still have to have some sort of strategic plan because you can't just shut Needham down and not have people driving on their streets. Thank you. Um, if if you have a request, like I encourage you to make it. Sure. Uh, but I, I understand that there are a lot of limitations. So. Uh -huh. Other questions on the sewer enterprise fund? Okay, so let's turn to the water enterprise fund. Similar to the sewer enterprise fund, um, water enterprise fund salary and wages are um, increasing. There, they're increasing a little bit less, which I assume means that there wasn't either as much turnover or you have less junior people. Um, and then expenses and services, however, are increasing at a much higher rate due to real inflationary increases um, for supplies for the water department, including um, things that we can't not purchase like water chemicals. Um, so there's, again, not very much that can be done um, with respect to this particular budget. I will note that there is an increase of um, $18,000 in the operating budget for software, which I assume is a one year um, increase or is that a software license um, re related to meter reading? I think it had to do with a change in the billing software. Uh, yes, I believe that that's an annual increase and annual not increase a one-time increase. increase. Um, the okay. current product that we're using is out of date. The new product will help us be able to detect water meter leaks more frequently, read the town much faster, um, So uh, and also provide us data on a monthly basis for individuals, even though we're billing quarterly, which has been a large complaint from individuals who've had leaks because they don't find out that there's a leak until three months after. So to be able to detect a leak within a month could have a serious benefit to the um, the ratepayers. Um, thank you. Um, good news, our PFAS levels are good. Um, so that's very good news. Um, and then um, I, I do have a question in terms of the other major increase which is increasing consumption of electricity and gas for the water um, enterprise fund. So if you can just explain that. Yeah, so... Um... It's kind of hard to remember because we've been in a flood situation, but last year we had a drought. Mm -hmm. And we pumped a record setting volume of water during that particular period of time. We pump from the water treatment plan and then we supplement that water from the um, uh, MWRA through St. Mary's. And so the reason that the uh, electrical increase, um, we use a three-year average, the electrical, in electrical draw was significantly higher during um, the fiscal 23. And so um, that is why we have uh, increased costs for the, this particular budget request. Okay. And if it doesn't, if the funds don't get used, they revert to the retainer. That's how this particular fund operates. Um, questions, comments, additions? Well, oh. If I may, just the one yes. thing I'll say is actually the opposite for salaries as far as junior versus senior people. It happened to be that we were transitioning so many older staff into newer positions in 20, um, between right. 24 and 25, that their salaries were set so much lower than the individuals who had turned over. So that was actually one of the reasons why we had um, a lower transition in water, whereas sewer has slightly right now more seasoned individuals. And so um, they're higher up on the pay scale and in continuing to grow versus um, somebody leaving and then somebody coming in with a step, but coming in significantly lower than the individual they were replacing. And right now I believe in water and sewer, we only have two vacancies. Um, but so next year you'll see a larger increase in water because now all the positions are filled. Yeah. yeah. So when you talked about the increase in the chemical supplies, mm -hmm. uh, in large part because of inflation, is that, under the public work supplies, the $33,000 change from last year? Yes. Okay, thank you. And those markets have always been volatile for um, water treatment. Yes, yes. they have been. Right. Any other questions? Are we going to talk about the DSR-5? Oh, the DSR-5 fleet refurbishment. Last year, I think we had fleet refurbishment for... Um, the general fund and, so and for sewer. 
And um, these we renew from time to time as the funds are depleted. And now water funds are being depleted. So um, there will be just a DSR-5 for the fleet refurbishment for water vehicles. And I think it is working well to extend the life of the vehicles and kind of smooth out that fleet um, replacement. And I think we talked about, you talked about fire vehicles and the, um, turnaround time, we're finding the same thing in a lot of our heavy pieces. Mm -hmm. And even in our light duty pieces, we are almost unable to get orders from Ford. The window is so small that they give municipalities. There's still a really hot um, uh, market for vehicles and they would much rather sell their vehicles at a markup to a consumer or to a contractor than sell them at a discounted rate to a community. So we have had a lot of trouble to be frank, trying to secure contracts, having contractors um, having um, uh, dealerships stick to their contracts, having the state enforce the contracts that they have pre-negotiated. So um, the having this fund has allowed us to basically stay functioning while it's taking longer for us to order vehicles than it has in the past. So my only question is, and I'm not suggesting that I have a position on this, but when you say it, it was... Uh, requested last year. I'm assuming it's funded last year. So last year we funded general fund and sewer. There was no request from water. Okay. So what, when was the last time? We've never we requested a request for water. This is the first time ever for a request for water. Okay. So it's it, it's going to end up though being the same type of thing as yes. we're doing currently yeah. for sewer. And for the general fund, yes. Okay. And so then the question I would ask is, and again, I'm no position on this, if it's going to be a regular expense, at one at some point do we consider putting it in the operating budget as opposed to a DSR-5, or is that not a preferred strategy? So I think the DSR-5 just gives the department more flexibility to address the needs on an annual basis, because they're not exactly, they're not even, and we don't fall well within this whole year. There's no, um, unlike other items that we would generally have in the operating budget, you have a fairly certain idea of what you're going to anticipate every single year. Um, this is really about extending life cycles of vehicles as the appropriate piece comes up and the appropriate piece might, might not be coming up every single year for um, refurbishment. How long have you been doing this and how long have you been funding the sewer refurbishment? So the sewer was added last year. We had a general fund refurbishment article that I believe we started right about when John started with the town. So six or seven years ago. And I think we've requested it twice since he has been here. Great. So have you, so are you, are you trying to establish now a kind of a history and track record of we identify pieces of equipment that we believe sort of in their mid-life cycle that we can extend their life cycle out by investing in them. Um, and it does have to do with the use. Yeah. Just, if this is something that you find is recurring, even if it's every two years or every three years, but if it's recurring, I think we should at least consider where it, where it sits in the budget. But this is the first year, so I understand. That, that's all. Thank you. I have a question about the source mm -hmm. of the funds. It says uh, free cash uh, for the it's retained earnings. Retained it. That's what was my question. Yeah. So it'll be retained earnings. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions regarding the water enterprise fund? No. All right. Let's jump into the general fund. Which is tab number four. Five, right? Five. Oh, sorry. Sorry. You guys are right on top of it. Well, I just want to make sure. <laughs> um, so, so this is just 22 million. Is that the total, including the DSR total threat? I don't have any questions. Let's move on. <laughs> Thank you. Just a joke. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there are a lot of DSR fours here. All right. Um, so, I think probably the better way to do this is to just go by um, division rather than um, DPW. So I didn't really have any highlights for administration, unless you have something that you want to highlight for us. 
No, the only thing I would say that might stand out for it um, stand out is that we are increasing our training budget. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to index our training budget actually based off of our salaries. So trying to get like a certain percentage, one to two percent of our salaries factored in for training. I think we indicated we have had a significant amount of turnover and the staff that we're recruiting um, historically had been people who are more seasoned in the industry. We're now hiring um, individuals who have less experience, but are eager and willing to work for the town, which means that we need to invest in them um, in order to educate them. We're sort of in the very beginnings, I would say, of a large retirement bubble that is about to hit the department. So we're trying to make sure that we are working with mentoring our newer staff to be educated by the staff that's been here for longer and then investing in them uh, in order to get additional training. Um, so that is the largest um, increase in admin and that's it's just easier to cover training under admin for all the divisions within the DGW. Um, one thing I'll note and I noted in our liaison meetings is that we have established the town of Needham um, as an entry level driver training program under the new federal requirements for CDL. And we have passed our first three individuals through that program. Um, if we were to require, all of our staff is required to have a commercial driver's license. And if we were to have gone out to a, um, a, a truck driving school, it probably would have been five to $6,000 per person. And they would have been heavily recruited by truck by long haul trucking companies um, because there's a shortage of drivers with that license. So um, uh -huh. it's a program that's helping offset the cost, but there's obviously um, additional trainings that we need to provide outside of the town. Um, Thank you. Any questions regarding administrative division? All right, let's go to building maintenance. All right, so the building maintenance budget, the net increase by request is um, over three quarters of a million dollars. And a lot of that are contractual increases to services that are provided, um, maintenance services, building repairs, um, you know, sprinkler maintenance, all those kind of things. Um, there is a very significant increase in um, contract cleaning, and there's also the SR4 request for change in how we do cleaning in um, the school building. So if you can just explain quickly. Um, so we, we um, went out to bid this year with an RFP um, to clean the... Um, the three buildings in town that we have outsourced, the high school, which is the one that's been outsourced the longest, the Pollard, and then the Newman that was outsourced a few years ago. Um, we went through a fairly competitive RFP process. We ended up picking a company that is um, has worked in Needham before and is a national company, and they defaulted on their contract within three months of working with the town. Um, I think the private sector right now for contract cleaning has become a fairly different market than when the town started to outsource cleaning and we as a town had a harder time attracting talent for custodial staff, which we have not had actually in the past three years when we have had staffing shortages in public works, our custodial staff has been fully staffed the entire time. Um, so what we found was we had to put the this particular item back out to bid. Um, we had already seen an increase in the price when we put the initial RFP out from what we had um, in our old five-year contract. And then when we put it back out to bid um, again, we saw another increase. So um, I think that was telling us that um, in order to meet the standards that we have for the cleanliness of our buildings, the contractors were, um, you know, understood the cost that was associated with meeting those expectations, um, which is why we're now looking at the concept of bringing one of those facilities back in house, because no longer is it clearly cheaper to outsource a building. Um, and particularly when you talk about scales of economy, just re um, bringing one building back in house doesn't require us having any more, um, we don't have to hire any more oversight and management staff in order to manage that one additional facility. So um, we ended up having to uh, basically clean all three of those buildings in-house this summer in order to get the schools open. I know the uh, superintendent recognized the custodians who um, work diligently. And I think that supports sort of the hybrid approach of having our own staff and having contractors. So when the market fails, we have our own staff to backfill. And if our, we have staffing shortages, we have the market to backfill. And you feel comfortable that you are you will be able to, if your DSR-4 is funded, hire sufficient staff to clean the human school to the standards that you need to meet and there won't be problems. Yeah, so we have hired. Um, so we've been constantly going through our hiring process. We still have had attrition, but the vacancy rate has been a much shorter period of time. 
because we've received qualified applicants um, who are here. So we don't believe it will have any issues in meeting that standard. I think additionally, we added a night senior as part of outsourcing that facility. And given the size of that building, we would likely keep that. So we would have somebody with clear defined supervisory responsibility on site. Okay. Um, any questions on building maintenance? And that TSR4 you're talking about was the Newman? Yes. Okay. But that was the only DSR4 for building. Yeah. Okay. Um, engineering. So at the engineering budget is also um, increasing pretty significantly. Um, salaries is the result of a transfer of salary from one department to another. So it's not a net increase for the overall budget, it's just a net increase to um, engineering. And then bringing in of the property surveys for $100,000, which was DSR-5, I think the last two years. Um, and then um, software license increase, which I don't think that can't be changed, um, the software license increase. But if you could talk about the reasoning for bringing the property surveys um, in-house. And yeah, I know it dovetails with the discussion we just had. So I think it's been a conversation with the yep. finance committee and I think actually town meeting for several years about whether or not this hundred thousand dollars was a time limited expenditure or if this was something that would um, be required uh, year after years for sort of an indefinite period of time. And, um, you know, in talking about it, we felt like it felt appropriate to migrate this uh, request into our operating budget as opposed to having it separate. We believe that within the one fiscal year period, we can do a hundred thousand dollars worth of property survey work. Um, one of the tricky things is that sometimes the surveys take multiple years to complete because of some of the records research that's required, um, but we can phase it out. So we'll make sure that each segment of the project can be done within the fiscal year. So the question I have on this, is, you know, but dovetailing on what I said earlier is, it, it, is it your view that you're going to have the need to conduct these property surveys on a regular yearly basis? for some future period of time. Uh, yeah. The only reason I ask is that I think we went over this last year and there was a very good presentation about the number of, of I think they were parks or, you know, these random little, you know, squares of, of land. And I, I, the reason I remember it distinctly is because I, I said, I, I'd love to know the names of all of these little parks and all these little, which then the gentleman was kind enough to give it to me. Um, <laughs> But I didn't hear at that presentation, I thought there was almost like a finite amount of surveys that needed to be done, but I'm, I guess that's not the case. So I would say it's infinite, but it is large um, as far as the volume of survey of pieces of property that the town has acquired, small little parcels of land. Um, I'll say, for example, there's probably three that came up in the last year. Um, there uh, was a committee, a joint committee looking at um, active recreation, including dog parks. So there's several parcels that we were asked to explore as far as the development of dog parks that we would need surveys on in order to come up with a plan on, on how to um, uh, engineer that. And then even just looking at the flooding issues, there's a lot of these little parcels of land that we could then develop for potential drainage accommodations, um, which you'd want to know what you own at that parcel before you develop it out. So um, it's not infinite, but I recall the list when we look out, it's probably five to 10 years worth of work right now that we have of, of parcels. And that assumes that, again, I'm not a surveyor, but that assumes that bounds don't move and things don't change and we don't have to go back and reevaluate that particular parcel. They don't float away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hello. So this carry is an expense item, right? It's not a salary, it's, a it's an expense, expense item, item. yes. I mean, is that performed in-house or um, with outside vendors? No, we use one of our pre-qualified consulting firms in order to perform that work. We sometimes help supplement it by providing them some data. How many, maybe we've asked this last year. I, I apologize if we, I did. How many of the parcels that are on the list to be surveyed don't have a survey at all on, on hand or how many of them are just outdated and we suspect that things have changed? I can certainly get you that list and I can update it with that information. Okay. 
Other questions on engineering? All right, fleet. Um, fleet um, division has a pretty small increase again. The increase is um, contractual. Um, fleet division has a DSR4, which is one that has been requested a number of times in the past. And um, I think um, there's a more in depth explanation this year of what the assistant fleet supervisor would um, do. Um, this would be a management position. And um, Harris, if you just want to go over that um, again briefly. Yeah, so I think after our conversation with the liaisons, we had an internal conversation about what's, I think there was a, what's changed in the past five or 10 years when it comes to fleet management. And I think the complexity of the equipment that we're now maintaining, because there's a lot more electronics involved, um, we are actually um, working with maintaining and el elongating the life of a lot of our heavy pieces of equipment. We found that there's a significant, there's not large pieces of equipment available for contractors for our snow and ice removal program. So a lot of the larger pieces now have to be supplied by the town, which means that we're second and third lifing pieces of equipment. So we're extending the life and maintaining more pieces of heavy equipment. Electric vehicles was certainly not even a thing that we had in town five or six years ago. And now we are maintaining um, the fleet division both maintains the, um, the equipment itself, but they also maintain all the charging stations within the town. Some that are primarily for municipal use and some that are primarily for public use as a public amenity. Um, and then I think the number, you know, we have the fortune of being well supported when it comes to um, purchasing new equipment. So we've had an increase in the past 10 years of how many pieces of equipment we're purchasing. I think we articulated earlier the struggle we're having sometimes of purchasing equipment. Same thing is true for parts. There's a huge markup on parts and it requires a lot more time and effort. And um, when we looked a little bit at just budget requests and budget expenditures, it has doubled, more than doubled in the past seven years. So one of the questions that came up was we have not increased the um, staff at the facility that is working. So does that seem like an appropriate level of management? And when we looked at it, we really had to think of it as management, not just of staff, but also of managing those expenses, of sending that equipment out and making sure that it's being, you know, we're, we're getting appropriate work being done, we're not getting overcharged, um, and managing that side of it. So those would be the changes that came into place that we saw that have happened over, you know, a 10 to 7 year period that we think would justify the need for an additional FTE in our fleet. And you also talked about the turnaround time, being able to maybe shorten the turnaround time for equipment repairs because now your mechanics can actually repair the equipment. As opposed to ordering equipment. Yeah, and doing research, calling around. Um, supply chain there is also an issue. Yeah, and it was even worse a few weeks, a few months ago when they had the um, the big three unions uh, had a strike. It became actually quite difficult to get pieces of the uh, repair parts. Yeah. Um, any questions on fleet? Okay, highway. All right, highway increase um, is actually um, somewhat substantial. Uh, net increase in expenses of um, $115,000. 50% of that are for engineering services that you don't have today. And 50% are contractual increases, you know, cost of roadway paving, asphalt, and other things. Um, so with respect to the engineering services, there are two different explanations provided. One is um, additions and adjustments related to complete streets, and the other has to do with um, retirement and turnover of more senior staff. Um, so, and because it's a kind of a substantial amount, $60,000, Karis, if you could um, talk about that a little bit more, and that's not a DSR-4 request. That was just incorporated into the budget. So um, DPW has been charged with a, a, the town of Needham became a complete streets community, which means that we have basically adopted the standard that when we evaluate a road for repair, that we'll take a look at the road to make sure that it's basically meeting the most number of users that possibly can. That means that it can support trucks, vehicles, pedestrians, and bicycles, and people of all walking, you know, mobility abilities. Um, we have been implementing that program whenever we do a paving project. 
um, or even if the utility is coming into, into town, which they seem to be doing a lot, we want to make sure that when they are repaving that road, we're making sure that we have if we have space, we can reline it, we can add in a bike lane, we can make sure that our sidewalks become compliant with um, ADA. And um, all of that does require some um, engineering component. There is a value, to, we've been doing some of that work in-house. The value of doing that on the outside is obviously a liability side, having a third party um, provide that information takes a little bit of, um, it's not sort of us watching ourselves. It now provides a third party to come in and provide that support. So um, the intent behind that is really to um, both provide the um, technical capacity. And then also if we're doing more things like adding more ramps, we would need inspectors on site. We only have so many staff. So it would provide us the ability to utilize one of our engineering firms to help provide inspectional services as well. Okay, we also have a DSR 404 highway for a uh, heavy equipment operator. Um, and there in the explanation, um, which is a pretty good explanation of how much more work could be accomplished if you now are able to basically add an entire construction crew to highway just by adding one heavy equipment operator. So um, have you done like some kind of a minute analysis of how much more work you would be able to do um, by doing that? Um... Yep, um, so the main focus of, um, of adding that we believe we'd be able to add is more sidewalk work that we could do in house. So um, doing the concrete work for the ramps is a little bit more complicated and we would, we would defer to outsourcing that work. But if we have areas in town that are topo topographically, it's just a matter of repair that needs to be made to the sidewalk or widening and it doesn't involve trees or poles, um, we could be able to do more sidewalk work in house. Um, so right now they have enough for one crew and then one smaller crew that just doesn't have the efficiency um, to be able to accomplish as much work um, over the construction season. Um, I do have, and I can just, um, finished putting it together and I can distribute it afterward um, an analysis of the project load and what having an additional um, FTE would be able to provide. Yeah, that would be very helpful um, if you could do that. And if I recall correctly, that was a position that Ryan Jason existed in what, 2000 and when was it cut? You had that extra position, 2006, five. Or so. I found Almost the memo years in, ago. in Rick's office, actually. Yeah. Seven or eight. <laughs> one of the memos, I yeah. used to counter it, but yeah. uh, <laughs> seven or eight, so I put up an argument against it, but, and, and what the values were, but um, yeah. trying to move back to that scale and efficiency is, especially with the private market as yeah. it is and continues to go up double digits on the inflation side, because they can, mm -hmm. um, that... Um, seems to be a good art, uh, argument for that position going forward. And are you retiring this year? I thought it was last year. I was, I, <laughs> you, said, you, said, you said you were never going to see me again. Soon. February 9th. Oh, oh that's, that's very soon. Yeah. <laughs> my, my, yes, my invitation's in the mail. <laughs> There'll be a position open. <laughs> 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 you, 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 next week, Jim. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Uh, any questions about highway? All right. Um, parks and forestry. Um, parks and forestry have a smaller increase to their budget. Those are all contractual increases. Um, however, they have two, I believe, DSR fours. Um, now, I don't remember whether it was last year or the year before that we funded a park ranger. Yeah, and uh, it's been a year and a half. A year and a half, so it was two, two bunch of cycles ago. Um, and that's been very successful um, in terms of what the goals were for the park ranger. So there's a request for another park ranger, a second park ranger, and then there is a request for a tree it's, I don't think it's called a tree survey, but that's essentially what it is. Um, so with respect to the park ranger, um, this would be a second position that would allow coverage seven days a week, as opposed to the five that you have right now. And so can you talk a little bit about what 
the other advantages would be of this particular provision. So I would say one of the things right now is we don't have coverage on Sundays and Mondays, and the Sunday utilization of our fields is very similar to our Saturday utilization. So it's a pretty high volume time to not have coverage. Um, I think the things that we've seen, I mean, I for as long as I've been with DPW, trash in the community has been a very large conversation about how to manage it at our parks, at our fields. I won't say that conversation's gone away, but I will say since we've hired the parks ranger, it has been significantly less. The volume has been turned down. And I think that we've seen a huge value in having somebody monitoring the parks, making sure that he's having conversations all the time with people who own dogs who have them in the wrong place or people who are littering to explain, you know, how to where the trash cans are, and then also providing additional cleanup services. Um, he's also been working to help manage the um, fields whenever you have conflicts between different user groups or there's somebody on the field who hasn't pulled a permit. Um, so they've, I, it's been very helpful to have this person on. Um, we've had issues with the graffiti in the like, late evening in the community that's been problematic. He's been able to get right there and clean the graffiti off or cover it up. Um, so having somebody here also a little off hours from the rest of public works because um, that position goes until the early evening um, has been helpful. Our goal is to hire somebody who will be required to work on Sunday and Monday. Our hope is to grab somebody who can work from Wednesday to Monday. So that way we have dual coverage on Fridays and Saturdays, which are um, one of our, you know, our busiest times. And then also the, um, and we think I was remiss if I didn't mention the school department has instituted half days on Wednesdays every other Wednesday, which does also generate a large volume of people in a lot of our parks that congregate at Greensfield, the Common, and Memorial Park. Having more than one person who can help sort of manage that and make sure that all the food they consume, all the wrappers end up in the trash cans um, would be helpful as well. So I think that's the hope is to grab somebody who can work um, during those, those hours. Um, but having someone who can cover Sundays and Mondays will be helpful in, in bridging that gap. If you can't find someone who wants to do Sundays, is are you still pursuing this? I believe we would be posting it as a Sunday. The position would be posted as requiring to work Sundays and Mondays. And so if you couldn't find anyone, then you just won't fill it. We would have to talk about whether or not there's a value in fill filling it. Because I, I I don't disagree with what your explanation is, but I just wouldn't want to hear that next year it's someone that worked you know Monday through Friday or something when it didn't take care of your key day, which was which was Sunday. But um, you know, having been served my time at the Memorial Park Trustees, mm -hmm. um, I, I know that that has always been a big issue for the trustees and Memorial Park. So um, if the first ranger uh, did a very good, effective job, then I think there should be at least consideration for this. What is, um, I'll leave my diatribe about parents. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're getting, we're, we're putting, getting, leaving them off the hook on this one, but um, so let's say that there's this position and it's um, there's an overlap on Wednesday. So what do two park rangers do on um, Wednesday, January 24th? So I could probably map out the plan, but I, right, well, I guess I'm, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not trying to be flippant, no, but, I hear you. but it, it, it just seems like that there's, there's more of a seasonality to it. Then there is in that I, I just wonder, and then there's going to be overlap where it's really hard to understand the, the need for two positions like this in the winter. And yeah. you know, and, and and so I just wonder what thought has been into you know making it a seasonal type program um, as opposed to um, a, a potential redundancy where we might not be getting the best bang for our buck. So I would say um, we do utilize the rangers as part of our snow removal program, and we have um, individuals who work in departments that are more seasonal, and we maintain those staff during the winter. So we have staff who can operate the snow during the snow and ice season. Um, but I can get more information. I imagine there's a lot that happens on a snow when we have snow coming in out of Memorial Park, and what the utilization is of our playgrounds um, even in the winter, because I I think. I know during COVID, it was, there was a lot of people using our fields, even in the winter, because everyone wanted to be outside. And I don't know if that's entirely diminished. I think people are still, you know, outside more than they were. Um, so I can certainly get you a list of 
interaction that the no, current yeah, person has not, in the I'm, day. I'm, I'm, yeah. I don't, you have enough to do, so I'm not. I don't need that per se. It's more of a, just a, mm -hmm. an out loud question of, of of because this is one where I'm struggling a little bit. Yeah, with so people it. are still um, walking their dogs. People are still going to the playgrounds. Kids, kids who have on campus. <laughs> <laughs> no, there were no park. Is, 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 park ranger, are they, is he or she identified in any way? Do they wear you know, hat? Smokey uh, the bear. Uh, you know, they have the town. Um, like how, have, how would I know who the town, who the park ranger is? Yeah, they have, um, you know, the town gear on. I get, you know, the town logo gear on and a hat that has the town mm -hmm. seal on it. Um, there's no big hat or. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But I would say if you talk to people who um, were or you know run some of our athletics pro athletics programs and our um, community programs, they all know who our parks ranger is. So he's um, made himself very prominent within the community, and people reach out to him and call him if they have issues during their their utilization of the, of the town resources. And that position reports to Parks and Forestry. It does. Okay. And is Ed still here or no? Ed is remote. Um, I don't see him. I was going to ask if he yes, has sir. anything to add. He might be under the. So I, I can put my Ed hat on <laughs> for the for the committee. So I talked to Ed quite is frequently. Is Ed still there? Oh, here. Is he there? There he is. I'll let Ed speak then. <laughs> Are you there, Ed? Coming on. I am here, and thank you for allowing me to join you all as a panelist. Uh, so we're talking about the park ranger? Yes. And what the park ranger would do, and if you had two of them on a day like today, Wednesday, January 24th, in the middle of, you know, winter, and I think it snowed and a little and rainy. Yep, so a day like today, uh, we would do his... Uh, daily routine, which is checking every park for litter, dog walkers. And uh, on a day like today, he'd go back to Memorial Park and we'd paint trash barrels or work on benches. So there's always something uh, that we need to do that uh, having the extra hands are, are a big help. So uh, yeah, like like today, we, we'll probably spend half the day in the field and then half the day painting the blue and white trash barrels. And if you had two park rangers? You have enough trash barrels uh, <laughs> to keep <you> busy. <laughs> between trash barrels, park benches, uh, uh, sanding, painting, th there's always something that we're doing. And again, like Karis said, uh, they're part of the snow and ice program. So big help in the wintertime to have the hands on deck. And I think we're seeing less and less snow these days. So as Karis mentioned, we're outside all year now. Uh, and I think in the off season, the park ranges get into the trails a little bit more. As we see the field users come off the fields, our focus is less on the fields and more on the town in general. And I think we kind of neglect our trails. And this time of year, Wu, right now our current park ranger is doing a little bit more trail work than he does in the in the on season. Mm -hmm. Other questions? No? Okay. Thank you, Ed. You're welcome. All right, recycling and solid waste. So um, that page was cut off, but um, the requests, again, are um, primarily contractual. Um, with respect to um, the recycling, we're still seeing that cardboard is gener generating income, but everything else um, is at a cost to the town. Um, and I don't know that there is much that um, can be done with respect um, to this budget. But if you want to talk a little bit about the RTS, and we do, we, did we remove the trailer? Did the, we, the old, didn't we have a trailer in the budget? Isn't this the one? There was a, a, the trailer got moved into the capital budget. Yeah, it's yeah. Trailer. Yeah. Okay. Um, so on the recycling side, I will say, I, I my understanding is our um, recycling company is very happy with the product that we provide, which is why we're still getting revenue. And it does help provide, you know, we have source separation, so we're getting clean materials. So we're getting a better rate um, for our products. One thing that's been interesting is that coal mingle, the value of coal mingle has gotten worse, um, almost to the point where um, at one point, commingle actually cost more to dispose of than single stream, which was not something that we had anticipated. And I think there's some conversations about 
what happens, Amazon keeps on saying they're going to stop doing the box in the box situation, um, which might actually deplete the value of, of cardboard um, because that's one of the largest buyers of cardboard. Um, so, you know, it's a volatile market and it is really based on the commodities. It's not so much based on the product that we're providing. Um, on the bigger picture, I'll just indicate we're starting conversations right now on our waste removal contract. Um, we have a contract with Wheelabrator that goes until 2028, um, but there are very few options for the town as far as removing trash. And so we are working with um, the same consortium that the town worked with 20 years ago um, to see if we can reestablish that consortium and try to negotiate a contract with Wheelabrator or um, figure out if we need to do something else. And getting 20 to 30 communities together and all on the same page is gonna take a period of time. So we're starting that process and Needham right now has volunteered to take um, some of the lead in that process. Most of the people who are in their positions 20 years ago or even 10 years ago when the contract was renegotiated and have left. Um, so that's probably the biggest area of we have like general concern. Right now, um, because our tipping fee is indexed from a, a it's off of a base rate, we're not seeing large jumps um, in the cost, but we know that we are paying below the market value right now for MSW. I think that maybe the only other thing is just this, the um, the food recycling program that we have started, and it's now been mobilized in the um, in all the schools. Newman's, we're having a meeting on Monday about Newman. The goal would be to transition some of the heaviest materials that have the least value in an incinerator out of that uh, waste stream and send it to an anaerobic digester. Um, as that program comes to scale, the cost per ton will, will be brought down. We're also hoping that somebody more locally than Maine will start to invest in this technology and will have less uh, trucking costs. Okay. I have questions. Yeah. So have there been any results from the um, study? Commission last year? No. So we went out to bid. Um, we did an RFP process and we received two bids for the study, the survey and the study that were over the the over the threshold for the um, that particular allocation. We are working right now on um, engineering questions for a survey first. Um, we're hoping to work with um, the town, the survey company that does the National Citizen Survey, Polco to help um, administer that survey. I think the idea being, if we can narrow down the options that we're studying be based on survey data and outreach and really have a company that focuses on surveys and outreach primarily, um, our goal is to have something out in the next few months for, uh, for consideration and then some sort of campaign in order to promote that to get the most amount of survey results we can back. Um, but we also wanna make it really clear that this is not, like this is a zero sum game, it's not, you don't get pickup and a seven day a week, you know, a five day a week facility and not have any cost increases, right? So um, we want to make it clear that like there are offsets depending on what opportunity we end up going to, either financial or in service delivery. So if any changes would be kind of far away. That's right. Any other questions about RTS and solid waste? Um, I did. And I apologize, I skipped over your forestry management program and mentioned that you had to get for um, This is, I don't even know how many times this has come back. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about that? So I think this is the first time we have packaged it all into one program. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's three things that we're trying to accomplish with this. So we have done, we had done a, um, uh, a survey um, through a partially funded grant program of the street trees in town, which is what, one of the items that we're required to maintain um, by Mass General Law. Um, that was done several years ago and it's sort of an outdated product. And this would be to update that survey. Um, the second part of this would be to address some of the increased tree removals that DPW has seen as necessary in the past few years largely precipitated by a uh, higher number of in, uh, invasive critters that are um, destroying some of the tree um, the tree canopy. So again, one of our charges is to make sure that the tree, um, the street trees are maintained and that they're safe. And so um, we only have three people who work on our forestry crew. And so they don't have, they can't do all the things all the time and having an outside company come in and assist with um, many of these um, removals um, will be helpful. 
And then I think the, the third component of it that sort of touches on the bigger issues of, of people wanting more trees in the community is creating a more aggressive um, setback planting program. We right now have a wait list for the setback planting program that we currently run. That program is run by town staff. So again, that's fit into all their other duties as they go and maintain all of the town trees, um, the ones on our town property, the ones in the right of way, and then um, also do planting. So instead of just relying on the two or three weeks a year that we can carve out of their time, we would bring in a third party to help um, add trees. And I think the idea is, is that because there is such a high demand for people to add trees to the community um, and concerns about the trees coming down within the community, that it provides an opportunity to help um, at least those who want trees get trees in order to help to restore that canopy. Okay, and ten thousand dollars of that is the tree inventory, which would be a one-time correct request. Any questions on the forestry management program? Okay, so then we have a couple of DSR files, um, and I think these are all recurring DSR files. Right. Um, the first one is where um, utility companies provide funds to the town, um, also it's for repaving and other work to be done. Um, and so this is just an appropriation for us to be able to extend the funds for the purpose for which we're collecting them, right? That would be correct. Yeah. There is some hope that the bill, the governor filed that. that I saw that, yeah. Be a correct task. Yeah. So, but absent that, this is just a kind of a technical so, DSR yeah, file. Yes. Yeah, we've been working more aggressively and making sure that when Eversource basically takes our road paving list and goes, all right, that's where we're going to go this year, which is our work, our work product back a year, and then they use it generally as an opportunity to try to not to have to pay to restore our roads. So what we're doing is we're working with them to collect the money that they had budgeted to restore the roads and have it deposited towards the town that we can use to offset our paving program. Mm -hmm. um, second DSR-5 is for your annual um, facilities and maintenance warrant article, which at the time it is submitted, um, we usually have a list of what the projects are that you anticipate doing. Um, Would it be easier and quicker for me to send that yeah. to you as opposed mm -hmm. to? Yeah. And we'll be talking about it again. Yeah. And, and then, yeah, well, sorry. And do you see that perspective where we, like, in the current year? Like what, you, what we've expected. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We'll find that. And that one tends to be expended pretty quickly. So I have committed that it will be 18 months yes. because by yes. the time we get access to it, it's already halfway through the construction season. Um, and then the last one also is um, a technical DSR-5 where certain funds are collected and have to be appropriated for transportation. Is, this is the Uber, I think. Uh, that actually should have been pulled because I believe now we collect under $25,000. Um, the town would say it's less than $25,000 in any year that costs $25,000. It's, uh, it's uh, receipts that may be expended without appropriation. Oh, okay. Right. Is there any restriction on how those funds are spent? They have to be used for transportation purposes. So right now we've allocated all the funds that we've received to bike accommodations. And um, we've started the treatment on West Street. We were trying to add it to additional streets, but unfortunately there's only one well, two, I guess, contractors in the entire state that do markings and they were doing a lot of work this year. Um, throughout the state and because of the weather, they had less opportunity to work. Um, but the green treatments that you see when you cross, um, there's a glass bead treatment to make it um, so it's not slick, um, also so it's reflective. Um, just using those at the intersections to make it really visible to drivers that there is a bike um, lane there. Um, that's the accommodation that we're adding in and that's where we anticipate these funds will be directed to. Does your department also maintain bike racks? Depends where it is. <laughs> I guess town owned bike racks. Yeah. For the most part, yes, yep. Between building maintenance at the buildings and DPW in the parks. Okay, so these funds could be used for that purpose too. They could. I think at one point we were looking at um, covered bike ra bike racks related to the MBTA and then COVID hit. So we sort of decided to 
pivot where those funds would be expended. Thank you. Okay. Anybody have any other questions for DPW? Yeah, I, I do. Um, I'm just trying to figure out, um, and I miss this sustainability manager. Is that a new position, a, a reposition of an existing position? Can you just give me an explanation on that? Yeah, it was a reposition of an existing position. We had a position in the administrative division that was responsible for permitting buildings after hours. That person retired in the last year. Um, we ended up looking in and there was a technological solution where people could effectively schedule their own utilization of the um, of the facilities with much more limited oversight. Um, and we worked with the personnel board in order to reclassify that position to a sustainability manager position. And is that, is that currently filled or is it? It is filled. So it was filled about a month ago. Um, uh, Gabby Queenan is the name of the sustainability manager and we introduced her to the select board at back in December. And can you just give me a sort of broad view of what a sustainability manager does? Um, so I think there's probably two focuses. Um, one is going to be looking at some of the recommendations that were made in the climate action plan, as well as other programs um, that are out there and help the departments um, implement those particular recommendations, or to be honest, translating them into an actionable item as opposed to sort of a theoretical um, expectation. Also looking for funding resources and other opportunities for the town in order to get grant funding, helping our building maintenance division um, as well um, when they evaluate trying to find financial resources to help offset some of the efficiency work that they've already been doing. And then I would say there's also a resiliency component to it as well, helping us when we're looking at either developing buildings um, or um, there's even a component I think that would interact with the um, that will interact with the planning board, um, making sure that the buildings are resilient, they have flood protection, that they um, are able to you know withstand some of the weather pattern changes that we're seeing. Thank you, Chair. John brings up a question which I might have asked in the past. I apologize for not knowing the answer. Just take this particular example. So there was a there's a repurposing of funds um, for which I don't believe the finance committee has ever been consulted. And so it, is that appropriate? Can a department just take whatever funds a prior town meeting has authorized and then within the line item change the purpose for which those funds are to be used? Uh, and I don't know the answer to that, um, but I do recall that there was a request for, I think, a sustainability position that was not funded. Um, so, so this yeah, kind of so reminds a me of a, a yeah. long, long question. time ago, mm -hmm. something to do with a foreign language lab up at the high school, which the finance committee under my friend here, Paul, we did not approve. And then the next year, the superintendent came in and we said, what's this? So this is year two. I said, well, who authorized year one? So maybe maybe you're one of the gurus on this finance committee stuff, Dave. Can you give us a little tutorial? Well, positions, uh, town meeting doesn't approve positions. They appropriate funds uh, for uh, salary and wages for the departments to do their charges. Uh, Positions, job titles, and such that's uh, done by HR. And if it's a union position, it's collective bargaining in terms of uh, compensation levels. Uh, if it's non representative, it's based on uh, HR and, and select board recommendations for uh, salary and wages. Repurposing positions, it's done regularly. Um, I would say in any given year, there's a uh, half dozen to as many as a dozen positions might be repurposed, recognizing the changes in the marketplace, changes in responsibility, uh, so that so when you hire individuals, they'll be able to do the work or or another way of saying it, not be able to say, well, I don't have to do that work because it's not in the description. So that's why descriptions are updated, that's why titles. And lastly, in terms of sustainability manager, there was uh, a suggestion by the finance committee that perhaps you should look at your existing resources and see if you can do this without increasing your FTE count. So 
I guess to follow on that, Madam Chair, I guess maybe in our budget letter, I would think it would, might be wise to ask every department, have you repurposed any you know, funds for a different position uh, that was not contemplated at the time that the budget was approved by town meeting? At least we would have, you know, be given a heads up as to what's going on. And I suppose it's still within our prerogative to not fund that in the next budget. Yes. Okay. So maybe we could make a note of just putting that in our budget instruction letter. I don't come up on the sustainability. My, my recollection, recollection is that there was a request last year for mm -hmm. putting the budget, but the town manager did not recommend it. It would be in the budget. And then subsequent to that, the select board al reallocated money from ARPA to fund the position. Am I misremembering that? I do not believe there was funding from ARPA for the sustainability manager. It was for the project manager, which ARPA was still funding. And, and um, but again, the conversation did that the finance committee was not interested in increasing headcount, but was and suggested that if that was a priority uh, to see if you can repurpose within your own uh, within your own budget. Dave, I just I recall what you're speaking to, and I think there was a conversation about whether or not they would repurpose a or if whether or not they would fund a sustainability manager in the interim out of ARPA. And I think there was a conversation that indicated that that would probably not be an advisable choice. Um, and they did not pursue that. Okay, that's a good question. I'm not against the notion of making sure we use our tax dollars wisely. And if we're not using them wisely for one position, perhaps they can be used more wisely for another. That being said, again, there's no analysis of whether that particular repurposed position has more importance than some other position that we're not funding. Then I guess, or, 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 or looking at the DSR fours right. that are put forward there, and and they're being put out as DSR fours. Right. And what was the analysis for that to be DSR fours as opposed as opposed to, to this position for the repurposed position? Right. right. Yeah. Good point. Well, a lot of homework to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Overall, we're towards the end of this. <laughs> or for DPW. For DPW. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for everyone. Thank you, sure. everyone. Eddie, baby, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>7. All right. In February 7th, we only have one departmental budget. And all the small citizen committees. Oh, and the citizen committees. Oh. I forgot about those. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a question on safe, require, and need, and where they they're going to come coming back. They're going to come back. Um, so um, I've been emailing Lars. She's last time I don't recall. 
Um, and uh, he's going to talk to me about some dates, maybe in late February. Okay. Yeah, I, I have a little more information on that. They they did have a meeting on Monday, which I could not attend. Um, the consultant member we appropriated a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, um, and they hired GPI to do it. Um, I, I think that the expectation or the hope was that GPI would get on a little bit sooner than they did. They're now starting to get going. Um, they issued a slide deck with a lot more information um, that still needs to be done. They haven't had a meeting with the MBTA yet. Um, it looked on an email that I saw today that they're proposing meeting with the MBTA actually at the golf course crossing on February 2nd um, to kind of have that dialogue. Um, and, and I just went through the slide deck quickly. There's one question that, that jumped out at me about that needs to be explored about if if there's a private crossing, which mm -hmm. that one is within a certain distance from the public crossings, does that mean you can't, those public crossings cannot be a quiet zone mm -hmm. by virtue of that private crossing not being a part of it? So the bottom line is there's a lot of balls up in the air. Um, and uh, um, I think the interesting thing is whether there's going to be, whether the people ascertain there's enough information and enough study has been done to put something on a warrant, this April as opposed to or um, I mean it doesn't sound like it there there is from what you're saying, but certainly there's a lot of public mm -hmm. effort going into this to have it on the town on the warrant in May. There is, but weight of our measured against, at least in my view, um, making sure that the hundred thousand dollars that we put out there is is um, we get the benefit of that study and it's not rushed and it, it gives us all the information mm -hmm. that we and everyone else oh, needs in order to I agree. analyze. I'm just, I'm just, I'm personally getting a lot of, and I'm, I'm sure we all are as town meeting members, getting a lot of requests okay. and correspondence. No, there is, but but let's say, but my point is we have appropriated hundred thousand dollars and if that study isn't complete, mm -hmm. there's yeah. no basis for any discussions mm -hmm. to take place. Mm -hmm. um, and until we have a number that's a, that is you know, reasonably certain, not a range of, uh, that is being currently discussed because we're going to need to plug that number into our debt financing mm -hmm. to see what it does to, to our ability to handle the schools and all the other projects. So there's a lot of, as I agree with both of you, that just a lot of work needs to be done. You're coming with debt financing and I believe there was a citizen petition uh, to- Eliminate it? <laughs> to, to um, uh, rescind uh, the two point five million dollars that was oh, appropriated for foster property. Good for them. Okay. Anything else? That's the motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Second. All right. Roll call, Barry. Yes. Hey, quick, Aaron, quick, yeah. quick, actually, quick question: What happened to the uh, building department? Wasn't that supposed to be tonight? Oh, they're rescheduled to next week. Okay. Thanks. All right. So you said yes? Yes, to adjourn. <laughs> yes, adjourn. Darren, John? Yes. Um, Ralph? Yes. Carol? Yes. Paul? Yes. Jim? Yes. Louise votes yes. We are adjourned. Yes.